Now let's talk about the tetracyclines. The tetracyclines all end in cyclin, and they include tetracycline, doxycycline, and minocycline. The tetracyclines work by binding to the 30S subunit of bacterial ribosomes and preventing the attachment of the amino acyl tRNA. Tetracyclines are the first class of drugs that we've discussed so far that are bacteriostatic, which I represent here by a policeman halting his whistle and putting up his hand to halt some people. Bacteriostatic drugs do not kill the bacteria like bactericidal drugs, but they halt the replication of the bacteria and allow our immune system to catch up with the infection. We will use this police officer to indicate bacteriostatic drugs for the remainder of the lecture. Tetracyclines are active against atypical bacteria. They have a unique ability to accumulate in cells and therefore are used against intracellular pathogens such as rickettsia, rickettsii, and chlamydia. Do you know what the word chlamydia means in Latin? It means cloak. The bacteria was named this way because it is able to cloak or hide itself within cells. For this reason, it is an obligate intracellular pathogen. Do you remember why it is this way? It is unable to synthesize its own ATP and therefore requires a human cell. This is one of the reasons it is considered an atypical bacteria, and some antibiotics are ineffective against it. Remember, the two treatments for chlamydia are tetracyclines and azithromycin. Now considering the rickettsia rickettsii bacteria, do you remember what disease it causes it? It causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Tetracyclines are also used to treat Borrelia burgdorferi and mycoplasma pneumonia. Do you remember what cephalosporin we use to treat Borrelia burgdorferi? That would be ceftriaxone. Very good. Ceftriaxone and doxycycline are the important therapies for Lyme disease. Do you remember what tick carries Borrelia? That would be the Ixodes tick. Very good. Common side effects of tetracyclines are GI distress and photosensitivity. More importantly though, tetracyclines are contraindicated in pregnancy because they can lead to congenital defects in addition to poor bone growth in the fetus. Also, it is contraindicated in young kids because it can cause teeth discoloration. Demeclocycline is a tetracycline that is mostly used in SIADH because it has ADH antagonist activity. Thinking back to physiology, do you remember what ADH is? It stands for antidiuretic hormone. And where is it secreted from? It's secreted from the posterior pituitary. Very good. ADH is responsible for the reabsorption of water in the collecting duct of the nephron in times of dehydration. Demeclocycline is an antagonist of ADH and can be used to counter the effect of this syndrome of inappropriate ADH. Thinking about electrolytes really quickly, what sodium concentration would you expect to see in a patient with SIADH? We would expect to see a low sodium concentration or hyponatremia. The concentration of sodium decreases because it's being diluted by the excess water that's being reabsorbed in response to the inappropriate levels of ADH. These drugs, important to remember, cannot be taken with calcium or iron-containing components because they affect their absorption. The tetracyclines are chelators of calcium and therefore are excreted if they bind with the calcium. The mechanism of action of resistance for tetracyclines is encoded by a plasmid. The plasmid enters the bacteria, it encodes an efflux channel, and that removes the tetracyclines from the cell. Also, it blocks the influx of tetracyclines by downregulating the channel responsible for its influx. Let me replay this animation. The plasmid comes in, makes an efflux pump, and removes the tetracycline from the cell. Now we're going to discuss the drugs that work on the 50S ribosomal subunit and bacteria. Do you remember which drugs those are? That would include chloramphenicol, clindamycin, the macrolides, and linazolid. Very good. We will start by discussing chloramphenicol. Chloramphenicol inhibits the peptidyl transferase enzyme of the 50S ribosomal subunit. Classically, chloramphenicol is used to treat meningitis caused by strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitis, or Haemophilus influenza, three common causes of meningitis. It is also effective treatment for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Also, you can see by the policeman here that chloramphenicol is a bacteriostatic drug. The most important testable material on chloramphenicol for step one is the toxicity that it causes. 
Chloramphenicol is not regularly used in the United States because of the severe toxicity. The drug causes three important side effects. Number one, it causes a microcytic anemia, as seen here. Number two, it can cause an aplastic anemia. And three, it can cause gray baby syndrome. Let's talk briefly about the first two toxicities and think back a bit to hematology. Do you remember what it means to have a microcytic anemia? This is an anemia characterized by red blood cells with an average mean corpuscular volume of less than 80. This image here is very high yield and is likely to show up on your board examination. Now how can you tell that this is a microcytic anemia? Well, there are a couple of techniques that I want to share with you. The first important technique that I use to look for a microcytic anemia is identifying an area of central pallor. As you may be able to see here, the red blood cells have an area of white in the middle of the cell. This is significant for a reduced production of hemoglobin because hemoglobin is what gives the red blood cell its color and is characteristic of an anemia. Another way to evaluate for the sort of anemia is to assess the red blood cell size. In a microcytic anemia, the red blood cell will be smaller. A quick and dirty way to decide if the red blood cell is small is to compare it to the lymphocyte nuclei. A normal red blood cell is typically the same size as a lymphocyte nuclei. However, as you may be able to tell in this image, these red blood cells are smaller than the lymphocyte nuclei and therefore you can determine are microcytic. Now let's turn our attention and consider the image of the bone marrow shown here. What do you notice about this bone marrow? There really aren't any cells in there. And what do you see instead of cells? It's pretty much empty space, right? Good, this empty space is represented of lipid droplets. The bone marrow here is what is called aplastic. That means it's without cells, because this drug is toxic to the rapidly dividing cells that are found in the bone marrow. Very good. And then finally, in infants, chloramphenicol can cause what is referred to as gray baby syndrome. Gray baby syndrome is a life-threatening disease that is caused by the accumulation of toxic chloramphenicol metabolites. These toxic metabolites dangerously accumulate in babies because of two key things. One, babies are unable to appropriately metabolize the drug because they lack an enzyme called UDP glucuronyl transferase. Without UDP glucuronyl transferase, the toxic metabolites cannot be metabolized and they build up to toxic levels. And two, in babies, there is reduced renal excretion and therefore the toxic metabolites build up and can cause a gray baby syndrome. The syndrome is characterized by an ashen gray color of skin, vomiting, limp muscle tone, and eventually a cardiovascular collapse. All right, time for a flash quiz. What class of antibiotics requires oxygen for uptake into bacterial cells? Those are the aminoglycosides, very good. The aminoglycosides require oxygen and therefore are ineffective against anaerobic bacteria. Clindamycin is another drug that works on the 50S ribosomal subunit. It works by blocking the translocation or elongation of the polypeptide strand. This drug is a bacteriostatic drug and is represented by the police officer here. The drug is effective against anaerobic infections such as Bacteroides fragilis and Clostridium perfringens, and it also is effective against group A strep. Most importantly, clindamycin treats anaerobic infections above the diaphragm. Particularly, it's used to treat anaerobic bacterial pneumonia. When we think about anaerobic bacteria above the diaphragm, where do you think they mostly reside? The anaerobic bacteria typically reside in the oral cavity. And do you remember what can happen if those bacteria travel into the trachea and then into the lungs? These bacteria can cause a severe anaerobic pneumonia. Do you remember what patient population is predisposed to this type of pneumonia? Alcoholics, seizure patients, altered mental status, are predisposed to inhalation of oral anaerobic bacteria leading to a severe pneumonia. Clindamycin is a treatment of choice for this type of pneumonia. Clindamycin is associated with an increased incidence of pseudomembranous colitis as it results in C. difficile overgrowth. It's important to know that all antibiotics predispose patients to C. difficile colitis 
but clindamycin has been more commonly associated than other drugs. Thinking back to other antibiotics, do you remember another one that is highly associated with pseudomembranous colitis? Very good. Ampicillin is an another drug that is commonly associated with pseudomembranous colitis. Now let's discuss a newer antibiotic therapy, linazolid. Linazolid inhibits the 50S ribosomal subunit and works by preventing the formation of the mRNA ribosomal subunit complex. Linazolid is a bacteriostatic drug that is only effective against gram-positive organisms similar to vancomycin. This drug is typically saved and considered a last resort only to be used for cases of MRSA where vancomycin cannot be used or in the case of vancomycin-resistant enterococci. Thinking back to vancomycin, do we remember how bacteria such as enterococci can become resistant to it? Remember, they convert the D-alanine-D-alanine residue into the D-ala-D-lac, making the vancomycin unable to bind to the peptide. Also, do you remember the four toxicities associated with vancomycin? Nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, thrombophlebitis, and red man syndrome. So considering the nephrotoxicity in a patient with chronic kidney disease, vancomycin might not want to be used and linazolid would be an option to treat MRSA, for instance. Linazolid is associated with peripheral neuropathy, bone marrow suppression, and serotonin syndrome. Thinking about serotonin syndrome for a minute, do you remember what it is? This is a life-threatening situation where there's an increase in serotonin. The syndrome represents a cluster of clinical findings, including autonomic, somatic, and cognitive effects. Some symptoms include headache, agitation, hallucinations, sweating, muscle twitching, and clonus. If this is noticed to be happening, the most important thing is to stop the medication. Thinking back to biochemistry, do you remember the amino acid that is the precursor for serotonin? Tryptophan, very good. Bacteria are able to become resistant to linazolid by creating a point mutation in the 50S ribosome RNA. This point mutation prevents linazolid from binding and allowing for translation to continue. We can see linazolid coming here, blocking the translocation. However, if there's a point mutation, linazolid cannot bind, bounces off, and translation is allowed to continue. Time for a flash quiz. Why are tetracyclines contraindicated in young children? Remember, tetracyclines can lead to discoloration of growing teeth. Now let's talk about a very important class of drugs called the macrolides. These drugs include azithromycin, erythromycin, and clarithromycin. These medications bind to the 23S ribosomal RNA subunit of the 50S subunit and block translocation. To remember that these drugs block translocation, remember the mnemonic macro slides to remember that they block the sliding of the newly formed polypeptide strand. These drugs are bacteriostatic and they're used against atypical organisms similar to the tetracycline drugs. The atypical organisms that they are effective against are mycoplasma pneumoniae and chlamydiae. In addition, they are also used to treat more regular types of microbacteria, including gram-positive cocci, as well as bordadella pertussis. Unfortunately, these drugs have a number of adverse effects, and they can be summarized with the mnemonic MACRO. The M stands for GI motility issues, in which we see an increase in gastric motility with the use of these drugs. Do you remember what it is called when we have a patient with decreased GI motility, say in diabetes, for example? We call this gastroparesis, or diabetic gastroparesis in the case of diabetes. Erythromycin can actually be used to treat gastroparesis because of this very side effect caused by the macrolides. The A stands for arrhythmias that results in a prolonged QT interval. Can you point to the EKG where the QT interval is? Very good. Now what does the QT interval on the EKG stand for? The QT interval represents the depolarization and the repolarization of the ventricles. And why are we concerned about a prolonged QT interval? 
because it can lead to torsades de pointe, a life-threatening cardiac arrhythmia. Another side effect of the medication is acute cholestatic hepatitis. Do you remember what this term means? Remember that cholestatic means stasis, or a decreased movement of bile through the biliary tree. Here we see a picture of the biliary tree. Thinking back to physiology, do you remember where the bile is produced? Remember, bile is produced in the liver and stored in the gallbladder. Macrolides reduce the flow or cause stasis through the pathway, which then leads to a buildup of bile in the liver and causing inflammation, hence cholestatic hepatitis. The drug can also cause a maculopapular rash, an itchy rash, as well as a peripheral eosinophilia significant of a hypersensitivity reaction. So here we can see the mnemonic macro, M-A-C-R-O. Very good. Also, it is important to remember that erythromycin and the macrolides are inhibitors of cytochrome P450. Do you remember why this is an important concept? Well, let's take a minute to review this because it is some high yield pharmacology. First, do you remember what cytochrome P450 stands for? Well, cytochrome P450 is actually a family of enzymes that exist in the liver who are responsible for metabolizing drugs and trying to get them out of our system. Do you remember the three ways in which the cytochrome P450 enzyme family can modify compounds? They can either reduce, oxidize, or hydrolyze various molecules. As a result of these modifications, the drugs become more polar and they are less active. Now thinking back to pharmacology, is the process that I'm describing here is phase one or phase two of metabolism? This process is phase one of metabolism. After being modified by the cytochrome P450 enzyme family, the polar molecules or drugs are then further modified in phase two of metabolism and then they're able to be renally excreted. Now, thinking back to macrolides, why does it matter that they are potent P450 inhibitors? Well, basically what it means is that macrolides and any other drugs that inhibit the cytochrome P450 system slow down the process of metabolism. As a result, what do you think happens? Drugs that are normally metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system are not metabolized as rapidly and therefore they build up in the bloodstream. This can lead to accumulation of toxic levels of some drugs that can cause some real bad problems for the patient. So it's important to identify any drugs that are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 enzyme family in patients that you prescribe macrolides. And just as a side note, do you know which macrolide has the least amount of inhibition on the cytochrome P450 enzyme family? That would be the drug azithromycin. Now let's continue on to discuss the mechanism of resistance of the macrolide antibiotics. Like with most other antibiotics, bacteria have found ways to become resistant to these drugs. Remember, these drugs bind to the 23S ribosomal RNA and block elongation or translocation of the elongating polypeptide strand. The way bacteria become resistant to the macrolide antibiotics is by methylating the 23S RNA subunit. By methylating this 23S RNA, the macrolide drug, represented here, is not able to bind to the 23S ribosomal RNA and therefore cannot stop translocation. 